Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is the uh, efforts of our group that's been working on bouncing cosmology. Um, let's see, got to wait for this one to come alive. Okay, one second. Okay, um, uh, the group uh, consists of, of course, myself, uh, Anna Iyush, who will be giving the second talk, and Franz Pretorius, who will be giving a talk on Friday morning. We also have in our group a new postdoc, Will Cook, who just joined us from Cambridge University, and we have postdocs, uh, Roman Kolevitov and Nick Sukov. Pardon? Something happened? Graduate student. Graduate student. Why did I say graduate student? Okay, sorry. I, I just graduated you. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. If you want to hear more or read more about uh, what we've been doing and uh, read the latest papers, uh, there is a website called bouncingcosmologies.com. That's easy enough to remember, and uh, you can catch up on all our activities uh, over, the, over the last year. So we're focused on this question. Is it possible that the evolution of the universe is entirely described by a theory that is dominantly classical. So by dominantly classical, that means it's the background evolution is totally predictive, deterministic. Uh, it means that uh, there's no quantum dominated phase at any point during this evolution. It means that uh, there's no quantum determined initial conditions, no dealing with quantum foam or emergence of space time. Of course, that means there's no Big Bang. Uh, the whole idea of the bouncing cosmology is that what happened 13.8 billion years ago was not a Big Bang, but rather a bounce, a smooth transition from some kind of contracting phase to our present expanding phase with a transition that we call the bounce. And in particular, we're interested in bounces that are classically determined. That is to say, all the physics of the bounce is determined to leading order by classical equations of motion. Uh, it means there's no period of quantum runaway, no opportunity for quantum fluctuations to build on quantum fluctuations to yield things like a multiverse. It means that the theory is going to, because it's classically deterministic, you can go, you can propagate backwards in time and forwards in time, and the theory should be classically uh, geodesically complete. Um, that means no beginning, a time and space, and no end of time and space. It means that the coarse grain properties uh, of the observed universe are deterministically set by classical equations of motion. That's not to say there isn't quantum mechanics. Of course, there's quantum mechanics at play. The fine scale details, like the positions of hot spots and cold spots in the cosmic microwave background, that's due to quantum fluctuations on this classical background. And those eventually translate into the detailed organizations of stars and galaxies. So there is quantum mechanics in the story, but it's subdominant throughout, throughout the story. So this is a rather ambitious idea, rather different than the prevalent idea that uh, has been dominating cosmology for the last 50 years or so. Uh, and it's a, a grand ambition. But I think you'll see that you know, we've gone pretty far along the line of establishing this grand ambition. Uh, there's still a ways to go, a significant ways to go, but so far there is no major roadblock that we've encountered. And if it's so, if it's possible to construct such a theory, then the next question to ask is, how would we know it? What signatures would it leave in, in the cosmos that we, could, uh, that we could use to determine that um, this in fact happened? Is there any information from the pre-bounce phase that makes it into the present phase? Yes, definitely, but how much information is, is, is coming forward? So these are the questions that we're trying to address. Now, to develop such a cosmology, as with any cosmology, you have to match up with things that we already know to be true based on observations. So you have to explain the complex structure we observe in the universe today. So today, um, uh, by today, I mean right now, and I mean in terms of the scale factor, I'm going to normalize my scale factor, A of t, which describes the expansion or contraction of the universe. I'll normalize that so that's equal to 1. So this is a snapshot um, from the two-mass survey showing the distribution of galaxies and clusters that are about us. This is our local universe, our local patch, if you like. And uh, we need to explain this complex structure. And one of the puzzles about this 
that we all know that's a challenge to any cosmological theory is that although the universe looks complex today, if we go back to a time when the scale factor was about a thousandth of its present size, it looked quite different. It looked warm or hot, depending upon your definition of warm or hot, and nearly uniform, nearly perfectly uniform, without stars, galaxies, molecules, uh, dust, etc. <clears throat> Not perfectly so. We know from the extraordinary work of our experimental colleagues that um, there is fine scale structure there at a level, you know, uh, fractions of a percent below the average temperature. And those are the fluctuations, hot spots and cold spots in the cosmic microwave background, which correspond to ver spatial variations in, in the density, uh, energy density of the universe at that time. So any theory worth its salt has to match on to this story. The question is, um, uh, even though we understand very well the evolution between redshift or scale factor of a thousandth to today, okay, we don't know, we are not so sure about what was the evolution before that led us to this point and what will be the evolution in the future. Those are open questions. So we know a lot about recent history in the cosmos and very little about what happened before and what ha will happen in the future. That's where there's room for theoretical, theoretical speculation and competing ideas. <coughs> now I'm going to be focusing in this talk on the periods outside of the bounce itself. The bounce itself is a crucial part of the story, but that's going to be the subject of honest talk, which, will, which follows mine. I'm going to be talking about why this idea of bouncing is interesting at all. Why do we think it has any hope at all of explaining the properties of the universe we observe? And that relies heavily on the period that precedes the bounce the period of contraction. Um, in describing this period of contraction, uh, we are going to need some basic relations, which are actually familiar to everyone in this audience because they're exactly the same relations we use to describe the expanding universe. The contracting universe, <coughs> except when we get to the instance of the bounce, will be described by classical Einstein general relativity to ideal approximation. So that means just like in expanding universe, we can define a scale factor, A of t. We can describe a Hubble parameter, which tells us how this stretching or contraction of the universe changes with time. The Hubble parameter, h, um, is positive if the universe is expanding, and is negative if the universe is contracting. When we analyze expanding universes, we rely on the Friedman equations. And those same equations apply for a contracting universe. Einstein relativity knows nothing about whether or not the universe is contracting or expanding, that's an, an initial condition. We, theorists, impose on it, and then we evolve the equations going forward from that initial condition. So here's a version of the Friedman equation, which tells us how the Hubble parameter, which describes the expansion rate of the universe, depends on what the universe contains and its geometry. So if you have matter, <coughs> you have some constant rho matter, which might say, say to represent today's matter density, divided by a cubed, the radiation density. You might have some other energy components, I'll just call it phi here, which have a different, what we call equation of state, epsilon. Epsilon is a measure, is, a, is the equation of state parameter, which measures the ratio of the pressure to the energy density. Some of you describe that ratio as w. Epsilon is 3 halves 1 plus w, if you want to translate to that, to that language. But it's, but the point is, it really just depends upon the equation of state of the universe. What is the stuff that the universe contains? Which couldn't, in general, be this sum of stuff. The last term of the Friedman equation is what's called the spatial curvature. That's measuring the curvature of slices of constant time in this theory. Okay, in, in, in general relativity, uh, in assuming a homogeneous and isotropic, on average, background. Um, now, um, you notice that in the Friedman equation, the dependence on the scale factor changes, is different for different forms of energy, different contributions, different types of energy density. That, chain, that difference in exponent there depends precisely on epsilon. So in general, it's just two epsilon. So if we're talking about matter, which is pressureless, so then epsilon is just equal to three halves, then two epsilon is three, and that's why it's a one over a cubed. If you're talking about radiation, where p over rho is equal to a third, then 
epsilon is equal to 2, 2 epsilon is equal to 4. That explains the 4. And then if you come by, if you add some other form of stress energy, dark energy, some sort of scalar field which is evolving with time, you have to calculate its epsilon, and then that goes into the slot for that contribution to the energy density. And there might be one or more such contributions to the energy density. But the thing is that at any given time, it'll tend to be that one of those contributions dominates over the others. This depends upon what the value of the scale factor is and what those coefficients are. And it will change over time. So one, one form of energy may dominate at one time, another at another time. <clears throat> so let's call the one that's dominant at any given time epsilon. Then as long as that one is dominant, then 1 over h, h inverse, is proportional to a to the power epsilon. And that'll be important for our discussion. So what we call the Hubble radius, the size of the observable universe, the state, the, the range of distance roughly over which we're in causal contact today, or the nearby patch of the universe that I showed you before, they're all of order h inverse. It's important to note that that goes like a to the epsilon. We'll be using that in this discussion. <clears throat> we can easily compute it, when such a component is dominating what's happening to the scale factor. It just goes like the absolute value of t to the power 1 over epsilon. I put the absolute value in there because I want to the same formula applies for an expanding universe as a contracting universe. The difference is in an expanding universe, t is growing from 0, it's increasing, okay? And in the contracting universe, in this language, you would describe it as t approaching 0 and, uh, and, a, um, and uh, uh, t approaching 0. Um, so we notice the power goes like 1 over epsilon. Uh, it's useful to distinguish the difference betwe uh, between epsilon less than 1 or epsilon greater than 1. When epsilon is less than 1, the power, which goes like 1 over epsilon, is large. So we will call that fast expansion or fast contraction depending upon which solution we're talking about. Because it means the scale factor, the stretching or contraction, is going faster than t. And if epsilon is greater than 1, then we call that slower contraction. Then the power is smaller than 1. So the scale factor or stretching or contraction is going smaller, s slower than t. Um, and this is also related to the acceleration of the universe. So we describe the acceleration of the universe in terms of the second derivative of the scale factor how much of the universe is accelerating, and that's proportional to 1 minus epsilon. So uh, if epsilon, again, if epsilon is less than 1, we said that's fast expansion, that's also a double dot positive. That's accelerated expansion. Or if the universe is contracting, it's accelerated contraction. Conversely, if epsilon is greater than 1, slow, then a double dot is negative. Epsilon is greater than 1, so a double dot is negative, and so the universe is decelerating. So slow and fast and accelerating and decelerating are synonyms. OK. Now, we, I could sit here or stand here and discuss the solutions to these equations, doing the mathematics. But actually, a nicer way of representing things visually, this gives you, I think, a good visceral impression of what we're trying to go for, uh, is to, a good approach for that is to utilize something that uh, Anna and I um, introduced uh, 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 a little while ago, the idea of uh, a wedge diagram. And we're going to simply take our equations that I discussed and represent them in terms of this diagram. So the idea of the wedge diagram is that you can, you can describe a, a cosmological theory in terms of, well, a wedge, something like a pizza wedge, except it's not a pizza wedge, it's a cosmic wedge, um, in which um, uh, it, uh, you have the two edges of the wedge, uh, which describe the evolution of the scale factor, just or measure the ev evolution of the scale factor. And then you have arcs that connect the opposite sides that would represent the physical size of some patch of interest. Okay, so we can imagine that we're describing the patch of the universe around us, okay, the patch size of the universe around us in which we're sitting in the middle and we're looking out in all directions, so we're looking at the patch list like I was showing you before. <clears throat> and so that dashed line rep may, may represent you know, the patch that we observe today, the local patch that we observe today. And then if you wanted to know what that patch looked like at earlier times, you simply, or what size was at earlier times, you simply construct the arc, that con uh, the azimuthal path that would connect the opposite wedges at that value of the scale factor. So, 
for example, here's the universe that we see today, and if I want to know what it looked like, what the story was, what its size was, um, uh, when the scale factor was half its current value, okay, I just move it halfway down the wedge. Or fourth of its present value, I just move it a fourth way down a wedge. Uh, of course, it would be evolution, local evolution, that would occur during that time for these short times. That's not captured in this. What we're really interested in here is sizes of things, not so much the fine details, at least to begin with. <clears throat> now, suppose you said, I'm not interested in such a big patch. I'm interested in a smaller patch. Well, and it's a patch still about me. Oh, that's no problem. That's just represented by a narrower wedge. Or you say, I'm not interested in a much larger patch that even extends beyond where I can observe. That would just correspond to a larger wedge. Okay? But the important point is to note that all these wedges end, have an end point, okay, a beginning or an end point matching at the same corner right there. And that is, in this original Big Bang picture, what we call the Big Bang, or even in today's Big Bang inflationary picture, we would call the Big Bang. Um, and that's supposed to be the beginning of space and time in the, sense that, in the same sense that that corner of the wedge is the beginning of the wedge. Okay. Now, I'm <coughs> calling it the Big Bang. I, I, I don't have to tell this community uh, this, but calling it the Big Bang is kind of a kind way of describing what goes on there. The truth of the matter is, we don't have a heck of an idea of what goes on there. We have interesting speculations. We don't really understand why the universe began. We have ideas that we talk about, quantum foam, emergence of space-time, and other ideas that we speculate might represent the Big Bang. Okay. But we don't really have a firm idea. It's still a speculative notion. Furthermore, we don't have a firm idea of how we actually make the transition from this quantum foam or quantum dominated phase. This is an example of a quantum dominated phase. We don't really have an idea how to do that, how to transition from that to a classical universe described by Einstein gravity, which is essential to attach to ordinary cosmology. So those are open issues. So rather than call it a Big Bang, I always think it's more appropriate to call it what it really is. It's a problem to be solved. It's a singularity problem. The cosmic singularity problem referring to the fact that if you just simply trace Einstein's equations back in time, as you were doing up to that point, back in time, you'll eventually reach that corner of the wedge where A goes to zero and there's nonsense. The theory becomes nonsense. It has to be replaced by something else. Okay, so that's one problem with the standard Big Bang cosmology that one has to contend with, and that's inherited by any other theory that relies on the Big Bang. Now, I said the wedge represents the patch size. There's another size, a second size, that we're going to want to pay attention to, which is the horizon size, which is essentially what I was calling the Hubble parameter inverse, the Hubble radius. It represents, in some rough sense, uh, how far you can see at a given time, okay? or what parts of the universe are causally connected at a given time. And um, as we already pointed out, <clears throat> just using the Friedman equation, the horizon size goes like a to the power epsilon. Now, in the standard Big Bang cosmology, this epsilon will depend upon what phase of the universe we're in. I said that as the universe evolves, different forms of energy can dominate at different times because the energy density contributions scale in different ways for the scale factor. So in the standard Big Bang cosmology, <coughs> one is, uh, it's hypothesized that one begins with a, a period where the universe is radiation-dominated, high pressure, and then as the universe expands, it goes to lower pressure, uh, it goes to matter-dominated, uh, three halves. And here I'm leaving out dark energy, but if you went to add dark energy there, that would go to yet lower pressure still. But let's stick with the original Big Bang model for the moment for the purposes of illustration. So <clears throat> if I'm interested in the fine details of cosmic evolution, I have to be concerned about this transition from two to three halves. There's a long period where it's two, a long period where it's three halves, and there's a quick transition. But for what we're going to talk about today, the only thing that's important about this value of epsilon is that it's greater than one. The fact that it's greater than one means the horizon size grows as a faster power than the patch size, which means that the horizon size is growing faster, uh, which, which means that the Hubble radius, the horizon size, uh, grows faster going forward in time, or if you begin from the present and extrapolate back, it converges to zero going back in time more rapidly. 
So now we'll draw the horizon size in our wedge as well. Let's assume that this patch that we're looking at at the right, that dashed line, corresponds to the Hubble patch today, the region we can see today, and we extrapolate back in time. Because of that epsilon, this is what it looks like. It converges to zero faster by an amount that depends upon that parameter epsilon, what the equation of state is. And the thing that you can, it's obvious when you look at this diagram, is that beginning at the present time, going backwards in time, the patch size, which is represented by the arc that connects the white lines, is always larger than the horizon size, which is represented by the width of the blue region. Okay? So if we're talking about the patch that we described, the farthest reaches we can see in the universe today of order the Hubble radius, then you go back in time. <coughs> oh, well, you notice that patch is now um, much larger than the hori horizon radius, because it shrinks like the scale factor, the patch size, whereas um, the horizon size is shrinking faster. And this, of course, would continue if we went back in time. Uh, it continues if we go back in time to a point when the scale factor is a thousandth of its present size. If we were to magnify the corner there, okay, what we'd now see on that patch is the last scattering surface, the surface in which cosmic microwave background radiation last scattered from uh, the plasma and began to head towards us. And, and we notice that that region is now much, much larger than the horizon size. I don't really have the scales right here. You should really imagine, the just because I can't do that in PowerPoint, the horizon is really much tinier at this point than this patch. And that leads to some issues. Not only do we have the singularity problem, we now have the problem of understanding why was the, pat the universe at that time so homogeneous when distant regions of it were outside each other's horizon. Okay? And this is what's known as the horizon problem. And it's just illustrated by this diagram. Um, and then, uh, and so, so therefore it's a question or a problem. How did the universe become so smooth over such large scales? What kind of physics could explain that? Um, <clears throat> and there's a second problem, which is those hot spots and cold spots themselves. Where did they come from? And now, we know that's generically a problem. Where did they come from? Uh, but there's something that's extra problem in this case, which is if you look at the sizes of some of those hot spots and cold spots, they're bigger than the horizon. So if you tried to invent an idea ab initio to explain the hot spots and cold spots, it's not just a matter of explaining some variations. It's explaining why some of those variations extend over a scale larger than the horizon at that time. So we call that the problem of super horizon hot spots and cold spots. How do you manage to get those? You need some mechanism to accomplish that. <clears throat> then there's another well-known problem, which is the flatness problem. The flatness problem has to do with the last term in that equation, the spatial curvature. <clears throat> so that's asking how curved the universe is uh, as a function of scale factor. Now, if you look at that equation and imagine an expanding universe, you can see that the curvature is decreasing. If you imagine a, um, a contracting universe, the opposite is true. That term is growing. So you might think that that's an is issue that is a problem for contracting universes. But the, it's important to understand that the flatness problem is not the question of whether that term is growing or shrinking. It's the question of whether that term is, how that term is growing or shrinking compared to the other terms how much it's weighing in to determining the Hubble parameter compared to all the other terms. So that's a different question. So in fact, to address that question, it's useful to divide the left-hand side by h squared. So you get a, all those terms on the top, now divide by h squared. And we're asking, the, uh, each of those terms represents the fractional contribution to the expansion of the universe of each of those terms. We often call those things omega, labeling it according to which form of energy density it is. So the first term would be omega matter, the second term omega radiation, the third term omega whatever else you want to add to your theory. And then what we're interested in at the moment is that last term, omega k. And when we're asking whether or not the universe is flat or not, we're really asking if it's cosmologically flat. And that's not a question about the last term on the first equation. It's a question about the last term on the third equation, whether omega k is large or small. Is it increasing or decreasing? So here's omega k, just written out. And if you stare at it for a moment, you see you can rewrite it. OK, you can do that math in your head. OK, it's just proportional to h inverse over a to the, power, to the second power. 
And we say, oh, H inverse, I recognize that. That's the Hubble radius, or the Hubble size. And the denominator is the patch size. So it's just proportional to the ratio of the Hubble size to the patch size squared. So the wedge diagram we've been drawing also informs us about what's happening to the flatness because it's informing us about the ratio of the Hubble size to the patch size. So we go back to our Hubble diagram, we remind ourselves, oh, the Hubble size to the patch size. I know those things. The denominator goes like a to the epsilon, and the denominator goes like a. Okay? And now that epsilon really comes into play here, if the universe is expanding, a is growing, then this is ratio is clearly growing. That means omega k is growing with time, depending upon the power of epsilon. <coughs> the bigger the epsilon, the faster it's growing. But it's a problem, because it's been growing in, in the standard Big Bang picture since the universe first emerged from the Big Bang, during which time, if you compute, put in the numbers for this ratio, it's some huge number, like 10 to the 50th or 10 to the 60th or more. Um, so you would expect that if the omega k began of order you know, 1 in the past, it would be huge today. It should be really obvious that the universe is curved, when what we've learned from our measurements of the microwave background is the opposite is true. The universe is actually rather flat. In fact, we've not measured yet, we've not re yet uh, resolved any contribution to the curvature at all. We've shown that, you know, today omega curvature is, you know, less than 1%. So that's a mystery. If it's been growing by such a huge amount all this time, um, the only way to account for the small value we observe today is somehow, magically, <coughs> after the Big Bang, it was already flat to 50, 60 orders of magnitude. So that's the flatness problem. So in addition to the problems we already had in the standard Big Bang, mo bang model, we also have this flatness problem. So these are the famous challenges for any model that is trying to explain the evolution of the universe, be it Big Bang or Big Bounce oriented. These are the questions we want to resolve. And we'll be hearing a lot about these same problems from probably everyone that's speaking, certainly today and maybe tomorrow. Okay. <clears throat> Now, there are various possibilities for what to do about this, okay? Um, but one thing that the diagram may make you think about is the Big Bang. All the problems I've talked about have everything to do with the fact that this wedge focuses down to a point, the Big Bang. Okay? So one idea you might think of, in fact, it might have been the first idea you would have thought of if you hadn't been uh, trained before or, or, or brainwashed before, uh, is to think, well, I should get rid of that, okay? That's the problem. That's the source of the problem. And so, you know, one idea you might think of, well, actually, pizza slices don't end at that corner. That's just after you cut the slice out. Let's put it back in the pizza and extend what's going on there, and that would correspond to the big bounce. So this is, the, this is a possibility for resolving this problem, a proposal for solving this problem. Um, so, um, as I said, the period of contraction and the period of expansion in this theory is described by the um, same Einstein equations. So if in the Einstein equations, when you're expanding, patch size goes like A and horizon size goes like A to the epsilon, the same applies when the universe is contracting. So except around the period of that bounce, which I said, which we'll hear about in the next talk, <coughs> these conditions continue to hold. So it's still true <coughs> that it's still true that uh, uh, throughout the evolution, it, we can, uh, the, pizza, the pizza, our wedge, you know, is described by a straight line, which describes the evolution of the scale factor with time. The patch size is still proportional to, um, to A of T. It's just that it's now decreasing rather than in the expanding phase where it was increasing. Okay, so the exact same thing. And the bounce is just simply <coughs> where we scattered off of. So uh, we've gone from a contraction to expansion. Similarly, the horizon size still goes like a to the epsilon. <clears throat> the difference is, on the right-hand side, a is growing. On the left-hand side, a is shrinking. Either way, as you approach the bounce, the, pats, the horizon size is becoming smaller and smaller. <clears throat> as long as epsilon is greater than 1, it, grow, it, it, um, it shrinks to uh, 0 faster than <clears throat> the patch size. So we're seeing that, in this case, the horizon size is huge and is contracting down uh, over here to the bounce, uh, eventually becoming smaller than the pat size, and then going out the other way, it begins smaller than the pat size, and is growing. Okay, they just inverse one another. <coughs> now, um, 
You might also notice in this diagram uh, that the right-hand side doesn't look exact, is not exactly symmetrical to the left-hand side. So what's going on there? Um, so, uh, oh, sorry, before I mention that, we'll come to that in just a second. Before I mention that, I want to mention that something that's immediately evident from this diagram, which is there is now, there is now no horizon problem. So if I begin with a patch on the right, and I extrapolate back in time, we saw that the, pat, that the patch size was always bigger than the horizon size. Okay, we saw that on this side, as we extrapolate in size, it was always bigger than the horizon size. And that remained true all the way to the bang. But now that we've added this other piece to the story, we see the situation reverses itself. And now look, the patch size is tiny compared to the Hubble horizon size. So it's not true that the universe was always larger than the horizon size in this picture. It's automatically the case that it is smaller than the patch size. The part, reason we see it's been inside the horizon for impact for a huge amount of time, or a huge amount of scale factor, maybe infinitely far back in time. And there's only a brief interlude between when the horizon size shrinks to be smaller than the patch size, which occurs here, okay, and then when it catches up again. So it's actually only a brief period where any patch of space is smaller than the horizon size, but there's plenty of time for it to be in causal contact before that point. And so the horizon problem just doesn't occur in these models at all. Now let me turn to the issue of why the left-hand side looks a little bit different than the right-hand side. <clears throat> and that has to do with what I call following the natural order of things. So in the Friedman equation, we see there can be different contributions that occur on the right-hand side, but that they depend on different exponents, which depends on this epsilon, the equation of state for the form of matter. <clears throat> And what we can see is that A gets smaller and smaller. Eventually, it's got to be the term with the largest exponent that ends up dominating the universe. So survival of the largest, if you like, as A gets small. So as you get around the bang, what you expect is the high pressure components to dominate, not the low pressure components to dominate. Models which impose the idea that there's going to be a low pressure, a negative pressure uh, near the Big Bang are running contrary to this rule. So that's why those models tend to involve a lot of tuning of initial conditions or parameters. But in this case, we do follow the natural order of things. As we approach the bounds, the important thing is that it's the largest contribution, epsilon, that dominates. And then as you come through the bang, you know, you go to the next order of pressure, the next order of pressure, et cetera. Uh, the story isn't exactly symmetrical because the, the, the component that we're imagining that is dominating as we approach the contraction is some sort of scalar field with some, which may or may not have a potential. If you have a scalar field, let's say the Higgs or something, or something like that, uh, and you're contracting, what you discover, just solving the Einstein equations, is that as you contract more and more, its kinetic energy density grows at a rapid rate, corresponding to an epsilon of 3 or an ex exponent of 6. So it grows, just a free scalar field has the largest epsilon in the equation, the largest epsilon will dominate automatically as you, whether you like it or not, it's going to dominate automatically as you approach the bounce. If it turns out that you have some potential which is negative, you actually get larger than three and you even dominate more. After the bounce, if you imagine that the scalar field is unstable or is destabilized by the bounce and it decays, then it turns into radiation and that's the next term that comes to dominate. So naturally coming out of the bounce, you come to radiation dominating, but that has a smaller epsilon. And a smaller epsilon you know, means that the opening, it, 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 uh, uh, the opening angles are different of the horizon on in coming in and coming out. And that's what accounts for the asymmetry that you're seeing on this side. So if we imagine a scalar field dominating at some point we come into here, then the horizon size remains larger than the patch size all the way until you know, near the end, okay? And then on the outside, uh, we have the radiation dominating. That, that accounts for the asymmetry. What about the flatness problem? Okay, so on the right-hand side, we said the ratio of the horizon size to the curvature size is growing by a huge factor. Okay? What about on the left-hand side? Now A is decreasing, number one, and two, Epsilon is bigger on the left-hand side than on the right-hand side. And three, there's no reason to believe that um, the amount of contraction you had was comparable to the amount of expansion you have, and generally you expect it to be much larger. So much more, 
You, you win by three counts in terms of flattening the universe. The scale factor is shrinking. Epsilon is bigger and occurs for a longer range of scale factor. So it's a super flattening effect. It's very contrary to our, maybe many, your intuition, that a contracting universe actually flattens and smooths. But that's actually the story. It's a super flattener okay, of the universe. Much more efficient quantitatively than, let's say, inflation as a comparison because of the differences in the epsilon and because of the range over which you undergo this contraction. Now, in fact, in general, um, not only is this, uh, not only, uh, is this uh, solving the horizon problem and the flatness problem, but it's really a super smoother. Super smoother, uh, much more so than expanding examples. Why is that? What do I mean when I say that? Well, first of all, I've already shown you that it classically smooths. There are schemes like inflation which classically smooth the universe. But the difference, uh, an important difference, is that although it's not only a classical smoother, it's also a quantum smoother, which is not true of the inflationary case. What do I mean by that? If I have a single scalar field and I'm expanding the universe at an accelerated rate, it's well known, and it's one of the things we all use in our calculations, that fluctuations in that scalar field, quantum fluctuations in that scalar field, become density fluctuations, curvature fluctuations, and they grow. They, the, the amplitude of those adiabatic fluctuations grow as the universe is expanding. So that's a problem. You're trying to smooth the universe, and you're fighting against quantum mechanics, which is trying to produce fluctuations, which are trying to in, uh, make the universe unsmooth. Who wins? Well, actually, quantum mechanics wins. Quantum mechanics wins. We've known that since the 1980s. We avoid that. We try to avoid that by super fine-tuning our models. The fine-tuning that occurs in inflation is designed to suppress the amplitude of those fluctuations which are struggling to grow and disrupt the, smooth, the classical smoothing. So we fine-tune. We introduce 15 orders of magnitude of tuning or more of our fundamental parameters in order, to avoid, in order to avoid that tuning problem, in order to avoid that uh, uh, de-smoothing problem. Okay? And actually, we don't exactly succeed. We can arrange it so that during the last 60 e-folds of inflation, the amplitude of those fluctuations are small. But if you extrapolate back in time just a few instants, you find that event you eventually reach, you reach an earlier stage where those fluctuations tend to overtake the smooth background just totally dominating over the classical evolution of the universe, producing the effect that we call the multiverse. Its origin comes from the fact <coughs> that we've lost control of those quantum fluctuations. That's why one ends up with a multiverse. And therefore, the outcome of inflation is not a perfectly smooth universe. In fact, if I began with a perfectly smooth universe, it would de-smooth it. That's what the multiverse is, breaking it up into patches with very different properties. So you're fighting against it, you're tuning against it, and the best you can do is end up with a multiverse. What happens in the contracting case? Well, the same argument that says those fluctuations grow when you are expanding, just reverse them, reversing the time, they shrink when you're contracting. So the curious thing is the quantum fluctuations of the scalar field, the adiabatic fluctuations, don't grow. So if you just have a single scalar field in your model, you end up with a super smooth universe. You smoothed it against both quantum and classical. That is the reason why you don't have primary tensor modes either. This doesn't just apply to the scalar field, it applies to all degrees of freedom, all mass, nearly all massless degrees of freedom, except for an example I'll come to in a second. So the same thing that suppresses the scalar fluctuations also suppresses the tensor fluctuations, which is why, you know, in bouncing cosmologies, you don't get primary B modes, or primary tensor modes, or primary gravitational waves. What's the word primary doing in there? Well, because we're talking about the fluctuations that are produced during the period of smoothing. Okay? Those are uh, um, what are often called the primary fluctuations. You can produce tensor modes in some later stage, late stage of the universe. When density fluctuations re-enter the horizon late in the universe, no matter what produced them, they will undergo barren acoustic oscillations. That means you're moving matter around. Those are going to induce 
tensor fluctuations. Those are what we often call the secondary fluctuations. Daniel and I worked on, Daniel and I worked on that at one, uh, at one time a number of years ago. Those fluctuations there, no matter which theory you talk about, because we know from the measurements of the microwave background, those density fluctuations are there, and we know that they underwent these barren acoustic oscillations. So that's, a, that's an indelible contribution that has to be there, although it's at a low level. It's at a level which is several orders of magnitude below what we can hope to get to, let's say, with the Simons Observatory or with other current ideas for measuring the cosmic microwave background. It's an interesting target to go for. So it's not completely out of reach, but it's not going to be in the immediate future. It's going to you know, depend upon advances in technology going forward in time. And according to the bouncing cosmology, that signature will be there. That is the B-mode signature, but it's this very suppressed secondary contribution, not the primary contribution. The other thing, of course, that doesn't happen in this theory for the same reason is you don't have this quantum fluctuations building up on quantum fluctuations uh, early on. There, for the same reason, uh, super smoothing, you end up with a multi, don't end up with a multiverse, you end up with, the fat, that, with that property. So these are two interesting distinctions compared to, let's say, expanding models. But now you might say, hold it, you, you, over, you, 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 you went too far. You made the universe glassy smooth. Where did those hot spots and cold spots come from? OK, let's go back to what I just said. I said if you have a single scalar field, you have a problem, or not, you have an issue that you've made the universe super smooth. If you end up adding a second field, a field which plays no role in driving the contraction, but is just sitting there, OK, it will also undergo quantum fluctuations, and they don't disappear. They remain all the way to the bounce. They produce what are so-called isocurvature for perturbations, which survive, which are produced and survive throughout the contracting phase. So let's assume for the moment we have one of those extra scalar fields. It will undergo fluctuations, just like we normally think about when we think about quantum fluctuations. They will produce fluctuations of all kinds of uh, wave numbers, all kinds of wavelengths, <coughs> but wavelengths which are smaller than the horizon. But in this case, back in time, the horizon is enormous compared to the patch size. So there'll be fluctuations of all the wavelengths. I've just shown one wavelength here, which span our patch size and more. Let's just focus on the part of the wave that's in our patch size. What's going to happen to it? Well, when the universe expands, okay, the wave is stretched. When the universe contracts, the wave is contracted. And it expands or contracts just like any other length scale, according to the patch size, according to A. So if it's produced at this time and I follow it forward in time, it looks like that. Okay. Notice that here it's inside the horizon. It's inside our patch, but it, I've, I've shown the part of the wave inside our patch, but it's also inside the horizon. It's again inside the horizon, but whoa, now it's suddenly stretching outside the horizon. And we follow through the other end, and it's outside the horizon. And that's what we were trying to explain. How do you get super horizon hot spots and cold spots? You can get it. It, it just occurs automatically owing to this cosmic structure. Here's another way of representing the same thing. Here's a circle. Let's imagine this represents the horizon size, say, at, at this time. Okay, So it's large. And the wave we're producing is a wavelength which is smaller than the horizon at that time. <coughs> As the universe evolves, we see from our diagram that the horizon size is shrinking faster than the than the patch size. So that means it's shrinking faster also than the wavelength of the waves. So if I take the next snapshot in time, I'll see that the wave has shrunk, but the horizon size has shrunk more. So right now, the wave is of order the horizon size. So that would be sometime around here. And if we go forward in time, it continues. The horizon size shrinks faster than the horizon size. And now suddenly, the wave is outside the horizon. And now you have a super horizon fluctuation. So contraction, when you add an extra scalar field of this sort, um, of, of, of general sort, will automatically produce isocurvature fluctuations that take you up to the bounce. And then one can imagine different physics in and around the bounce that convert, to, convert it to true curvature fluctuations, or adiabatic fluctuations. So those of you that you know, or, or have studied inflation know this phenomenon very well. It's known in the inflationary field as a curvaton effect, where you add a scalar field whose fluctuations compete 
with the fluctuations in the, in the, in the primary scalar field, which is driving the expansion. However, in those cases, there's a competition because the adiabatic fluctuations are growing and you have these curvature fluctuations. And so if you're going to play a curvaton game, you have this problem of how do I get the curvaton to compete with the inflaton? I usually have to tune something in order to make that happen. Here, there's no such effect. The adiabatic fluctuations aren't there. In the contracting universe, you get no contribution from the primary fluctuations. The only fluctuations you're going to get are from, are from anything else that happens to be around that undergoes the fluctuations. You'll need one extra degree of freedom in order for that to happen. Here's a concrete, ex here's a concrete example of, oh, sorry. So this is how you solve the, the super horizon hot spot, cold spot problem conceptually. In more detail, <coughs> here's a simple example of a theory that does the trick. It has two scalar fields, a scalar field psi, which may or may not have a potential. Let's say it has a potential, a negative potential, <coughs> which is rolling with time. And it's driving. It's the dominant form of energy density during the contracting phase. Okay? And so it's the one that's causing the, the slow contraction that we've been talking about all along. But now we have a second scalar field, chi, which is kinetically coupled to it. <coughs> In this setup, it's quite simple to show that what happens is that during the contraction, fail, uh, during the contraction phase, the psi field evolves, but the chi field is kinetically frozen at the, at the classical level. It can have quantum fluctuations, but it's more or less at rest during, the, during this process. And this scenario, as you contract, the contraction is stable. The path, the trajectory is stable. The fluctuations you get are nearly scale invariant. The fluctuation spectrum, the power spectrum, is Gaussian. And the scalar fluctuations, the only fluctuations you produce in this process are the fluctuations in chi. We have not affected the fluctuations in psi. They're still not contributing, just as they didn't before. And we're not affecting the tensor fluctuations because nothing's affected those. So you still get scalar density fluctuations, and you still get no primary tensor fluctuations. <coughs> now, some of you who have been following this issue discussion of bouncing cosmologies, I should mention, may know that in the early days when we were first exploring these ideas, we, had the, we thought we had the case that you had to have non-Gaussian fluctuations with significant non-Gaussianity. What we learned uh, since beginning with 2013 is that, in fact, that was, that's not generic. There was a feature of the fact that the models that we produced in those early days Ha the trajectory that you had to pa pass along as the universe was contracting was unstable. And that instability led to the non-Gaussianity. But then, beginning of 2013, we realized that that's not generic. In fact, simpler models, models with fewer degrees of freedom, less tuning, et cetera, actually will give you these properties, which match up well with what we actually observe. So the superhorizon cold spot problem is solved in this sense. But then, with all that being done, you should turn your attention to what is the key bottleneck or challenge in this story, which is the bounce itself. So what I've shown you up to this point is that all the properties you would like in the, to have in the universe after the bounce can be achieved by this period of slow contraction leading up to it. But now we have to make sure that we can smoothly transition all from the contraction phase to the expansion phase <coughs> without disrupting all that lovely stuff we just produced. Can we do that? <coughs> well, that's um, a key question. Um, if you had asked me this question a few years ago, I probably would have said I'm very skeptical that that can happen. But developments in the last few years, especially developments led by Anna, have you know, led me to change your mind and my mind. And I, um, I think, well, you'll, you'll see what you think uh, by the time you fin you, you, we finish uh, our discussion this morning, our discussions this morning. Um, but the idea is that just as the evolution leading up to the bounce was fully classical and the evolution after the bounce should be cl fully classical, we are looking for a bounce which is also fully classical, fully deterministic, no quantum domination occurring during this phase. So that means we don't want to have the universe contract to a point where the density becomes so large that you have to worry about quantum gravity effects or you have to worry about quantum fluctuations. We want the universe to bounce at a lower energy, energy density scale. 
and it should be fully classical to leading order. When I say fully classical, I always mean to leading order. It should be fully classical. Sometimes this is called a non-singular bounce. I don't particularly love that term, but that's the way it's often referred to in the literature. It's a bounce which bridges between the contraction phase and the expansion phase. The contraction phase, in, this, in one case, could be semi-infinite. You could begin with a, an infinitely large, nearly Minkowski universe with a very ultra-thin uh, density of matter and energy and just let it start contracting and reach this bounce and then expand forever into the future. And that would avoid a beginning and avoid an end, a geodesically complete, classically geodesically complete description of the universe, producing all the properties in the expansion phase that you think that, that we observe, that we, that we want to have. And not only would it avoid a beginning, but as I've emphasized, it also avoids the high density phase where quantum gravity would directly play a role. So we're very interested in how quantum physics and gravity come together. We would love to have a theory of quantum gravity. Many of us are working on those kinds of ideas. <clears throat> but while that's important for understanding the connection between quantum physics and relativity, um, it may or may not be important for explaining why the universe is the way it is. It would be important for other things, but maybe it only plays an indirect role in setting up you know, the basic physics that underlies it, but without playing a direct role. You don't have to go through a quantum gravity-dominated phase. Um, now, can one do all this? Uh, well, that's an interesting challenge. To answer that question involves going beyond the usual technology that cosmologists use to describe Big Bang cosmology or Big Bang inflationary cosmology, the perturbation theory and the kind of analytic techniques that we commonly use, or you, that the cosmologists in the audience have all used, are insufficient to answer the question of whether you can go through the bounce, because the bounce itself is a, some sort of nonlinear effect. So you need to go beyond linear analysis that we're, that we're used to and that we've been all trained with and that we've developed since the that we've known since the 1980s and develop a new technology, a technology which comes from, well, some other source that you're going to hear about in, in just about half an hour. This is going to be the subject of honest talk. So I'll stop there and ask for questions. <laughs>